He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. This is a good old-fashioned bad cop story, and the bad cop we're talking about is John Cullen, the head of New Zealand's police force from 1912 through to 1916. And to tell his story, I spoke to historian Mark Darby, who's got a bit of an obsession with Cullen. I was reading about and studying and and, uh, researching other aspects of New Zealand history in that early 20th century period, very interesting period for us, a very transitional kind of period, a lot of things changing. And... This guy, Cullen, always seemed to be lurking on the sidelines whenever anything really ugly <laughs> or, uh, or, or controversial was taking place. He was somehow always there on the sidelines. Like many Kiwis at this time, Cullen's story begins overseas. He was born in Ireland, a really pretty part of the country, Glenfarn in County Leitrim. Think rolling green hills, hedgerows, quiet lapping lakes, the kind of Ireland you'd expect to see on a postcard. But it was a pretty miserable childhood. Cullen was born in the dying days of the potato famine. His family got by scraping the earth for turnips, with most of the money they earned going towards their rich landlord. It was um, absolutely destitute, and he grew up in in a stone hut with a thatched roof and no furniture in it, basically. He had about seven or eight brothers and sisters. His father was just a farm labourer, so he had very few prospects in life. And when uh, the opportunity came to enlist as a policeman, he grabbed it. Cullen joins the Royal Irish Constabulary, but these aren't the kind of police you'd think of today. You wouldn't be calling these guys up for help if someone nicked your TV. They're more like the kind of cops you'd call if you needed help to crush an armed rebellion. And their training was extremely strict. One part of their uniform when they were training was a um, something called a stock. I'd never heard of this before until I was reading about it. A stock is a thick leather belt which goes around the neck and buckles at the back, and there's a strap coming down from that which attaches to a belt around your waist. Sounds very uncomfortable, but what it does is hold you rigidly upright so that you've got your chin in the air and your nose pointing up, and they were and the, as long as they were wearing the stock, this is the way they had to stand and walk and move. And it was designed to give them this parade ground posture at all times. After a few weeks or months of wearing the stock, that's the way you walked and you kept it up. And Cullen certainly, he moved that way for the rest of his life, the way people describe him. Shoulders back, head up, ramrod spine. I've got a photo of Cullen sitting in front of me and you can see what effect that training had on him. He's absolutely rigidly upright and he has these slightly bulging eyes. Maybe that collar he wore was a little bit too tight. As well as being taught to stand up straight, Cullen learned how to fire in volleys, march in unison. The IRC were a paramilitary force, a force built to suppress the kind of rebellious movements in Ireland, which eventually turned into the IRA. Cullen did well with the IRC, but he was ambitious, and it was an old-fashioned police force with an established officer class. It wasn't possible for a man like him, who was born poor, to climb up through the ranks. So he does what a lot of Irish people were doing at the time. He jumps on a ship and emigrates. For him, the destination is New Zealand. Cullen rises quickly through the New Zealand police force. His creds with the IRC were well regarded, and Cullen himself had an iron sense of self-discipline, which his higher-ups respected. He really makes a name for himself as the union movement is just taking off big time in New Zealand, and the conflict between the unions and the government is getting seriously heated. It was a perfect opportunity for someone like Cullen, who had training in how to crush rebellious forces. Cullen saw himself as the the action man, as the hitman for that anti-union campaign. He crushed a number of strikes and other uh, labour movements with extraordinary uh, ruthlessness and often with tactics that were quite illegal, even in in the fairly rough and ready conditions of, of his own day. His idea was to go in with overwhelming force and wipe out whatever he saw as being um, in the way of the interests that he represented, the business interests of the country. It kind of makes sense when you look back at his background, though. I mean, that's what he was in training for in Ireland, was suppression of insurrection. He would have just seen it like that, wouldn't he? You could say so, but as well remember that he came from the very poorest of the poor himself in Ireland. I think he might be a case of having escaped from uh, conditions of poverty and and having zero influence and status within Irish society, having acquired a great deal of status and authority in New Zealand society, 
he was ruthless towards those people who were still like he used to be. You know, he was one of those people who, having got out of an unwelcome situation, had no sympathy for people who were still in that situation, none at all. Cullen rises to the very top of the police force. He becomes commissioner in 1912. But he'd probably just be a footnote in the history books if it wasn't for an arrest raid he makes right at the very end of his career. He's 66 years old at the time and actually due to retire. This raid takes Cullen deep into the dark, misty forests of the Uruweta Ranges to a village at the foot of Tuhoi's most sacred mountain, Maungapuhatu. To understand the raid, we have to zoom out a bit and look at how things are going in New Zealand as a whole at the time. This raid happens almost immediately after the Anzacs retreat from Gallipoli. Hundreds of thousands of people are just reeling as they deal with the fact their husbands and their sons and brothers and fathers have been killed or horrifically injured or psychologically scarred. And as the country's hurting, as it's reeling from the shock, it lashes out internally at what are perceived as the enemies within. And one of these internal enemies is a Tuhoi prophet called Rua Kenina. Rua's story is fascinating and complex, and I just don't have the time to give it justice. If you want the full story, you should read Mark Darby's book, The Prophet and the Policeman, which goes way into depth about both Cullen and Rua. The important bit for Cullen's story is that Rua famously preached that his followers shouldn't sign up to fight in the war. Actually, he's so famous that there's a song about him, um, which I found on YouTube, that I'm reliably informed by the comments section still gets played at two hoi parties today. Rua Kinana. So there you have it. Rua Kenina said Māori shouldn't sign up, and a lot of people listened to him. You can see why they would. For a lot of Māori, particularly in Rua's part of the country, the government's kind of the enemy. The New Zealand wars had only ended 50 years ago, and many of their parents had died fighting the government, including Rua, whose own father was killed. The tension from the New Zealand wars was still being felt on the Pākehā side as well. They're really suspicious of Rua. He, he was seen as letting down the side internationally and of being an unwholesome influence on his own people. And even there were absurd suggestions made that he had machine guns mounted there and that he was planning some kind of um, attack or or that he was uh, training his people to fight against Pākehās if the war was lost. Uh, These were nonsensical allegations, but a lot of people did believe them. I mean, there was even an article, I think it was in the New Zealand Herald, which described him as a Māori kaiser. Yeah. There was similar rubbish spoken uh, 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 about other people around the country at that time. It, people were paranoid and were prepared to believe all sorts of nonsense about having um, traitors in their midst. So Cullen decides he's going to go get Rua. The problem is Rua and his followers aren't really doing anything illegal. Māori were mostly exempt from conscription, so Rua was perfectly within his rights to tell them not to enlist. The only thing Cullen could get him on was sly grogging. That's an old-fashioned term for selling alcohol without a licence. So Cullen puts together a huge group of police officers and then personally leads them into the bush to go make the arrest. The police advance on the marae from three directions. Two of the groups were led by local officers. They're the first to arrive, and things are pretty chilled out to begin with. It seems like Rua knew he was going to be arrested, and he wanted to make sure it happened in a dignified way. So he goes out of his way to treat the police with respect. He greets them personally, shows them around the community, and makes preparations for a feast. He even goes so far as to raise a Union Jack flag with words written on it, which read, Kotahi te ture mo na iwi e rua. One law for both people. That's when Cullen arrives, and pretty much immediately things get really tense. If you've ever been on a marae, you'll know that the uh, that the visitors wait outside until they hear the uh, welcoming calls and then they go on. Well, Cullen wasn't even prepared to wait for that. He said, if we wait, he'll, wait, he'll get away. He'll escape, so we're not going to wait. And he was advised by his own Maori-speaking police to follow protocol and just wait a few minutes for the local people to welcome him on and then they said, we'll go on and then we'll arrest him. He said, no, we won't. We'll go straight in there now and catch him. And so the police march up. There's almost 60 of them, some mounted on horses and all heavily armed with rifles and pistols. 
Rua and his two sons, Fatu and Toko, walk up to meet the party. And what happens next is, well, it pretty quickly descends into chaos. According to Rua, he takes three steps towards Cullen and the police charge. Rua and his sons turn around and sprint for a gully. The police are in hot pursuit. This is the part most eyewitnesses agree on. One officer's armed with an axe. He grabs Rua and brings him to the ground. He drops his weapon in the struggle. Rua's son, Fatu, picks up the axe and raises it above his head. But he gets brought down in a flying tackle by another constable. Toko keeps running and escapes the officers while they're busy subduing Rua and Fatu. And then... A shot rang out. Now, there remains, to this day, dispute as to which side the shot came from. But there is certainly strong evidence to suggest that it came from the police side, that some trigger-happy policeman felt somehow or other um, the situation was about to explode. A bullet flew, the locals uh, retaliated, and, and gunfire blazed for some minutes thereafter. Toko picks up a shotgun and begins blasting pallets at the police from behind a fence. The officers advance steadily, firing their rifles from the cover of tree stumps. A bullet hits one of Toko's companions, leaving him severely injured. Another shatters Toko's forearm and he crawls away, trying to hide under a house. His mother's house, actually. What does seem indisputable is that at least one of those guys was shot in the back from above while attempting to crawl under a house to escape. So he was executed, in effect. He wasn't offering any kind of resistance at all. The other one who was shot had already been quite severely injured by an earlier bullet and was obvious, uh, appeared to be in no position to... Um, was no further threat, if you know what I mean. He could no longer fire his firearm, uh, but he was shot anyway. While the bullets are flying, Cullen's screaming at Ruhr to tell his men to stop shooting. Like I said, complete chaos. It was a disgraceful display on the, uh, on the part of the police. I mean, given that uh, Cullen had been trained by the Royal Irish Constabulary, he clearly had forgot all his training in the heat of the moment because guys were firing while their own men, their own comrades, the other police were running in front of them in the line of fire. You don't do that, as I understand it. And naturally enough, these guys got peppered. Uh, the miracle is that the injuries weren't more and greater than they were. But yeah, certainly several police caught bullets, and one quite severely. Aside from getting some of his own officers hit by friendly fire and overseeing the execution of two men in cold blood, the raid goes pretty well for Cullen. He hauls Rua off in chains and the prophet sentenced to two years of hard labour at Mount Eden Prison. It looks like Cullen really is going to go out in a blaze of glory like he wanted. But then, shortly after the trial, there's a letter. It gets sent to the New Zealand Herald and it's been signed by eight members of the jury. And they say they never wanted to see Rua convicted at all. It turns out Cullen made a gigantic mistake, and it made the whole case against Rua unravel. It's found that he had failed to take note <laughs> of a very basic principle in the law, which says that you can't serve an arrest warrant on a Sunday. Well, it happened to be a Sunday that they were there attempting to arrest Rua. This was illegal. He couldn't do it. The, the charges that they planned to arrest him for, they fell over. Not only can you not arrest someone on a Sunday, but if you try, they're entitled to resist and call other people to help them. So the entire gun battle was completely legal from Rua's side. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's perhaps disputable that you can resist to the extent of opening fire on people, but uh, the, the, the basic legal principle is that Cullen had stuffed up and, uh, you know, he, he, he refused to admit this, but he doesn't come out of this at all well. And, in fact, his reputation did suffer from this, this arrest of Rua, even though I think he hoped that it would be the highlight of his career. In some ways, it was the low point. In case you're wondering, these days the police can arrest people on a Sunday, and even in Cullen's time you could be arrested on a Sunday for a serious crime, but something as small as sly grogging just didn't cut the mustard. Luckily for Cullen, he has a very sympathetic judge, who decided that while Rua was not technically guilty of anything, he was, and I quote, morally guilty. <clears throat> And that's basically the end of John Cullen's bad cop story. He goes out more in a haze of confusion and incompetence than a blaze of glory. He finishes his career in the public service as the Commissioner of Aliens, sentencing Dalmatian migrant gum diggers to deportation and hard labour, mostly without any good reason. There is one last thing, though. Call it Cullen's encore. 
because despite the embarrassment of the Rua raid, he still has enough political support to have one last go at stamping his mark on New Zealand. And he stamped so hard that a hundred years later, the Department of Conservation is still trying to scrub out the mark he made. And he does all this in pursuit of a retirement hobby. Here's Mark Darby again. One of the hobbies he, he, he liked was hunting. He, he liked to, um, to shoot bird life and so on. There wasn't much chance of doing that in the North Island because there weren't much in the way of game birds. So he had the idea that if he could plant heather in the National Park, the Tongariro National Park, all around the, um, island, uh, the mountains in the centre of the North Island, and if the heather took on, then he could introduce game birds like the ones that he had known when he was growing up in Ireland, things like um, you know, grouse and partridges and so on. And so he had this vision that this is what would happen to the central North Island and it would become an international game park. People would come from all over the world to blast away with shotguns and he would be one of these people and he would be like the sort of local lord of the manor showing them around. He was quite open about this. He believed it would be a great thing for the country if this happened. And to, 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 to head it off, he imported sacks of heather seed and spread it by hand and, and when, he, uh, when he needed more help, he simply got um, prisoners from the local prison farms around the area to spread it for him and infested hundreds and hundreds of acres of the park with heather, which is now a major noxious weed in that area. Conservationists of the time did their very best to stop him and he simply would, would call up Bill Massey, his mate, the Prime Minister, if need be, to get the authority to carry on doing it. And um, you can look at this now and think, what an absolutely appalling way to behave, and it was. But it was largely driven by the fact that he was so convinced that he was right and he had the confidence of the government that he could get away with things that were, on the face of it, flagrantly illegal. So, if you're driving down the desert road in late summer and you see the purple flowers of heather peeking through the tussock, remember John Cullen, the son of an Irish turnip farmer who rose to the very top of the New Zealand police through iron self-discipline, a talent for pleasing those in power, and, to put it bluntly, a lack of concern about whose neck he stepped on along the way.